Hello, I'm Cherry and George uh, in Hong Kong. It's uh, my great pleasure to welcome you on behalf of my fellow Academia SG founders and editors, uh, Linda Lim in Michigan, and in Singapore, Tio Yu Yen and Ian Chong. Uh, we are probably new to many of you. We are only two and a half years old. Uh, so by way of introduction, let me say that we are a collective of Singaporean scholars uh, with no formal institutional home, uh, although we do have a, a nascent arrangement with the Association of Asian Studies uh, through its Malaysia Singapore Brunei Studies Group. Uh, we've also worked with various uh, university departments and centers in Singapore around the world uh, to promote Singapore studies. Uh, three weeks ago, um, Academia SG launched a report on academic freedom uh, in Singapore. Uh, and uh, it was based on a survey of around uh, 200 uh, social science and humanities <laughs> academics. Uh, who are currently affiliated with Singapore's five autonomous universities. Uh, a significant minority of respondents, particularly those working in areas that they suspect are politically sensitive, uh, reported that um, they do not feel able to uh, research, um, uh, teach, or engage the wider public without constraints. Um, we found that these political constraints have been institutionalized within universities. So in their open-ended remarks, uh, several respondents uh, made the point that um, beyond the uh, external governmental uh, pressures, academic institutions play a key mediating role, either buffering individuals from external pressures uh, or compounding those pressures. The underlying point that institutions matter is of course unremarkable and even obvious. And this is why the announcement two weeks ago that Yale and US College would be dissolved uh, into NUS uh, in 2025 was big news. Uh, so big that the opposition workers party has asked the government to explain uh, the decision. It will be debated in parliament on Monday. Uh, the purpose of this evening's webinar is not to litigate the closure of uh, Yale and US. My uh, colleagues and I at Academia SG are trying to keep an open mind about the exact institutional arrangements that might best serve the interests of a liberal education. Uh, as individual academics, the four of us have spoken at Yale and US, uh, no colleagues and students there, uh, and we admire the work that they've done. Uh, we have a similar connections with the University Scholars Program at NUS, uh, which will absorb Yale and US, as well as with Nanyang Technological University's own excellent University Scholars Program. And beyond these self-consciously interdisciplinary programs, there are, of course, outstanding pockets of liberal arts education within disciplinarily defined departments, uh, including our own in sociology, political science, economics, and media studies. Uh, of course, the reason why the government and NUS thought it worthwhile to pour a large sum of taxpayer funds uh, into Yale and US College was the not unreasonable belief that institutional arrangements matter. Uh, beyond gathering academics uh, of excellence, as well as eager and capable students, uh, we need organizational structures, uh, the right leadership, as well as the right ethos to enable special things to happen. Uh, there was obviously a belief among policy policymakers and the university leadership that something like Yale and US could offer something more than NUS could. Uh, NUS now wishes to graft this more onto the parent institution by 2025, uh, making Yale and US redundant. Uh, if this plan is to succeed though, we need a clear idea of what exactly that more is. And to help us, we have invited two Yale and US insiders, uh, faculty member Robin Cheng and uh, recent graduate Haoli Chiang. At Yale and US, uh, Haoli helped found CAPE, one of the most prominent student organizations operating in Singapore civil society today. Now, by most accounts, uh, Yale and US has allowed their students more latitude than their peers enjoy elsewhere in Singapore higher education. 
Uh, so to help us situate this development in a wider context, uh, we've also invited as our third guest, uh, Meredith Weiss, an authority on political participation, social movements, and student activism in the region. After we hear from our three guests, my Academia SG colleagues will join the discussion. Now, we've received many questions from you in the audience at the point of registration. Uh, they have helped guide the planning of this session, so thank you very much for that. Let me first turn to Robin. Uh, I know you don't claim to speak for your college or even your colleagues, but uh, from your own personal vantage point, you know, if Yale NUS was conceived to offer something more, what exactly is that more? Yeah, sure. Thank you so much, Cherian, for having me here. Um, so um, I, I like this question. Um, I do think there is something more, but I really want to emphasize that it's not something more in the sense of better, um, but the sense of something different. So what I think is really um, at stake here is that there are different models of education, as you said, different institutional arrangements. Um, so I come from the US. Um, for my undergraduate degree, I went to a small liberal arts college, about 2000 students, so twice the size of Yale and US, but very small. Um, then for my graduate degree, I went to a large research institution. So that was about 40,000 undergraduates. Um, and then you have all the graduate students as well. So very, very different um, educational structures here. Um, and I think that Yale and US and um, university scholars programs, I'll just shorten that to USP, um, that these really do represent different ways of um, approaching education. So Yale and US is much more like that. It is a small liberal arts college. It's a kind of self-contained community, whereas uh, USP um, is, um, is part of this large research institution, but it has this, but it acts as a sort of add-on component. So it's kind of combining elements of the large research institution with the small liberal arts college. Um, so I, I myself uh, loved both of these institutions um, and they're just very different. So different students can thrive, I think, in these different types of environments. Um, what the, the closure of Yale and US has done essentially is eliminate one of these models um, and, and it just sort of take one of those options out of the mix. Um, so to say a little bit more about the, the differences specifically between Yale and US and USP, I think here are a few of the important differences. Um, at Yale and US, it is residential for all four years. So students live on campus with each other um, for their entire degree. Uh, at USP, there is a, a minimum of two years residence. So everyone lives um, in Cinnamon College, this is about 600 students altogether for their first year. And then they have at least one other year, but that could be any time between their, their second through fourth years. So, um, so that's one difference is the amount of time you spend on campus with other people in the same program uh, or, or living on campus, I should say. Um, another difference is the way that the, the Yale and US Common Curriculum or the USP um, foundational classes uh, form part of their, their overall education. So um, at Yale and US in your first year, um, you only have one class that is up to your choosing. That could be in something that you will eventually major in. All of your other classes for that first year um, are going to be done as part of this common curriculum. The entire first year takes this set of courses together. I, as a faculty member, teach in this common curriculum with a team of other faculty members. Um, and so you only declare your major uh, usually at the end of your second year, and that's when you specialize. Whereas for USP, you, you apply directly to the major before you even uh, start uh, your university education. Um, and you can start taking your major classes right away. So uh, even though you have these foundational USP courses, it really is the major, that specific discipline, which is the sort of foundation and core, as opposed to Yale and US, where this broad-based common curriculum was sort of the foundation or core of, of your education. And so then once you get into your major um, and you pick up your minor as well, there's differences there too. So Yale and US faculty, belong only to Yale and US. Again, it's sort of self-contained. And so they teach major and minor classes 
um, still with this model of small seminars, usually capped at 18 people. Whereas with USP, the major and the minor courses are taken with the rest of uh, the, the NUS major. So it's that large research setting. Um, and there it will be lectures of 40 to 100 students, tutorials of 10 or 10 to 20 students, but those tutorials come every two weeks um, instead of twice a week, which would be more normal at Yale and US. Um, I mean, this is all, I, I, I'm sure there are differences in, in very specific places. This is kind of in broad strokes. Um, so what I want to emphasize about Yale and US, what, what you see here is you have this small group of people who are spending a lot more time with one another. Um, this uh, is something that I think makes a big difference because it's not just particular texts or what's on the syllabus, the, the list of readings that you'll do, or even the kind of methods in the classroom that makes the difference. You can do all of those um, in USP and in parts of this large research university. What makes the difference is this community of people that you're spending all this time with. Um, so people often call this the, the tight-knit community. So, um, what I thought I'd do is say a little bit more about what that actually looks like and, and why it matters. Um, so at the faculty level um, at Yale and US, so what it, what it means, I, I would say, is that it is a very intentionally designed um, community where there are these multiple and overlapping networks of relationships. Um, so for me at the faculty level, that means I came in with a cohort of faculty, we all know each other because we started at the same time, but then I have a sort of circle of faculty that I teach in the common curriculum with, but then I also have these faculty that are all in the philosophy major, and these are not totally the same, although there's a lot of overlap, and then I have all the faculty that are uh, have offices close to me in the residential college. So these are the big towers. Um, we have three residential colleges in, in Yale and US. Um, for the students, there are these similar kinds of overlapping and multiple networks. So they have the in, incoming cohort of people in their year. They have people in their majors. Then they have uh, in these living arrangements, they have their suite mates, but then they have everyone on the same floor as them. And then they have everyone in the same tower as them. And then of course, there's all the student organizations. So, um, so what this means, I think, is that to a much greater extent than I've seen anywhere else, and I've been in the US, I've been in the UK, I've been in Singapore, um, faculty and staff are kind of universally acquainted and friends with one another uh, at that level. And then students are friends with uh, one another. And then faculty and staff are also acquainted with or friends with, with the students as well. So you have all of these relationships. Um, and the reason I think that matters, the, the most important reason, I mean, you get all these wonderful memories and, and things like that, but it, it makes a big difference in the classroom, I think. So uh, in a Yale and US classroom more than, again, other classrooms that I've been in elsewhere, um, what you see is, you know, across this group of 18 students, there aren't the sort of little groups and cliques of people who are familiar with each other and they sit in the same place all semester. Instead, people talk to each other across the entire classroom and they sing happy birthday as an entire class to one another. And what that facilitates, um, so for me as an instructor, what that allows me to do is have very, very active self-driven learning um, that happens in the classroom. And what I mean by active learning is that the students are really doing the work. So they go up to the board and they, I'm a philosopher, so they will um, practice reconstructing arguments. So looking at a text and pulling out the, the logical pieces of it, or they will practice um, uh, defining a key term and they write their own definitions on the board. And so they're doing all of this work to practice the skills that they need um, and they do it in a way where they're not just accountable to me. So in, in other classrooms, it's often like there's some student and they're speaking to me, and then there's other students and they're speaking to me, um, even in a small seminar setting. But at Yale and US, because of all these relationships, they really are speaking to one another and they're holding each other accountable because they, they really admire and respect one another and they push each other to do well. So I, I very rarely worry about people being, you know, scrolling on Facebook or being off task because they keep each other on, on task and they're doing this work together. And, and I always tell them I'm doing the work with them. So as they do their tasks, I will do them also. And then we compare our answers. So these kind of horizontal relationships are really different from um, a more traditional kind of hierarchical 
faculty on top and, and students, uh, you know, listening from below. And I think this is especially a valuable uh, experience for first generation or working class or otherwise marginalized students. So I say that partly as a um, the co-chair, I was the co-chair of the diversity and inclusion uh, committee. And um, there was a, a great article that came out in the Atlantic about uh, the effects of liberal arts education for first generation students. Um, and they, they, they cited a study with these kind of ingredients for long-term success for anyone from a non-elite background. And you get so many of those with the, the small liberal arts college model you, because you get these, um, so I'll just name some of them. So a strong support from a faculty mentor makes a big difference. And that's something that you get when you know each other personally. Um, a commitment to keep learning after college, that's something you get when you sort of separate out the knowledge that you're getting as valuable for its own sake, as opposed to merely instrumental for some very specific um, vocation. Um, the audacity to dream big, um, programs designed to build up professional networks and social capital. Again, these are all things that you get because you have a group of people who are forming these relationships. Um, so so the, the last thing I'll mention about that is that I think it really does cultivate this kind of ethos of liberal arts, which I know people will talking about more, uh, will be talking about more, but this kind of exchange among free equals, of course, we're, we're still far from that. And there are always constraints and power dynamics. Um, you know, there is a teacher and there are students and there are various social hierarchies. Um, but I do think that we get a kind of democratic exchange um, in the classroom and throughout the entire college, which is really valuable. Um, so, so students and faculty too get these skills of negotiating um, disagreements and different points of view. Um, and the reason that it can work very well, I think is because there is this um, foundation of common ground and again, relationships, like you, there's limits to what you can um, say um, in terms of your disagreement, if it's somebody that you still wanna keep this relationship with. Um, and so that combined with this universally shared kind of commitment to Yale and US, its mission and its values really makes the difference. So I've probably said way too much, but just very quickly, I wanna finish up by saying something that I've heard from, from Yale and US students and alumni that even aside from whatever the value of the community is, um, there is a loss just for any kind of community to be sort of suddenly dismantled. Um, and taken apart. And for the Singaporeans, they have, I have heard them say that they feel that this is part of, you know, a much larger pattern that um, communities or buildings or green spaces can sort of just in one fell swoop from someone's decision somewhere, just be completely eliminated. Um, and there's a real loss there. Um, and speaking as an educator, thinking about my students, I think another particularly tragic loss about this particular decision about Yale and US is that it, it really affects um, the ability to recruit uh, faculty and staff. Um, so academic faculty, um, not a lot of people know this, but it's actually extremely difficult to get a faculty job in the current uh, job market. Um, and once you get one, it's very, very difficult to move. So for faculty um, to go anywhere where this kind of decision could suddenly change the, the type of work you're doing or even make it so that it's very easy for you to be let go later, that's, that's very, very scary. Um, and so uh, anyone who is sort of got other options is now gonna think twice about coming to Singapore. Um, and I think that's a real loss for uh, students who um, will now have a much harder time gaining access to um, these really, uh, really, again, sort of sought after and, and important faculty who are doing really important research. So um, I'll, I'll finish there. Uh, thanks so much, Robin. That's been very, very helpful and I think in demystifying uh, so much of uh, what's actually going on behind uh, the walls of Yale and US, which I think is more talked about than understood. So that's uh, really helpful. And I think the, you know, the, uh, what you said about both the uh, the cost at the the human or personal level as well as at the national level of a sudden move like this, of course, is something that we want to talk about uh, uh, more. Um, uh, Howley, you of course uh, were a beneficiary of this uh, you know, grand experiment in uh, liberal arts education. Uh, you've just graduated. Uh, you founded the group Cape, uh, which has tried to make an impact beyond the ivory tower. 
Uh, Robin spoke uh, earlier about tight knit communities, and of course, one danger of tight knit communities is, they, is that they become uh, inward looking. But I think nobody who's familiar with Kate can accuse uh, uh, the students there, and I'm sure other classmates, uh, of not trying to look out. Um, so, and uh, I'd like you to talk about your experience at Kate, but more broadly, what uh, from a student's point of view is the more that the that now your alma mater uh, provided. All right, thanks for having me, Sharon. I, I think it's it's nice that students or recent students like me get to speak at all compared to the events of the last few weeks. I can really attest to all that Prof. Robin has said about Yale and US, but I'd like to speak further as, as, as you say, a student and as someone in the civic space. Right, so to answer your question, I think Yale and US was very much a transformative experience for me as a young Singaporean. I don't think I would have been able to get an education anywhere else in Singapore coming from a relatively non-elite background uh, like Yale and US, right? I believe that a lot of this is really deeply rooted, as, as uh, Robin has said, in, in Yale and US's civic ethos of its liberal education, the kind of active citizenry that incubated and when I when I talk about liberal education today I think Meredith may talk about it later more as well is that it's not about socially or politically liberal right when we mean liberal we mean in the sense of liberation unlocking minds transforming the way that we think nurturing global citizenship this is a phenomenal Singaporean brand liberal arts program but today, I, I don't want to indulge about how exceptional Yale and US was for its students. I want to instead really talk about how Yale and US was, uh, was an important transformative experiment for Singapore's own democratic development as a whole as well. Right? And I think it was a specifically the success of this experiment that perhaps also was one of the factors that led to its shutdown. Right? Although Prof. Dunning Chai has very generously offered himself up as the target board, the reality is that the speed and unilateral authority by which Yale and Yas was shut down points to the fact that this decision was really far above his pay grade. Right? We cannot ignore the fingerprints of uh, political impetus behind this decision. In order to understand why this is happening, we have to situate Yale and US within the greater context of our state society relations, right? So to, to answer your question on the more, right, I want to respond to two brief comments, right? Uh, firstly, why Yale and US was such an unprecedented civic space and what made it special? And secondly, why shutting down this experiment is a loss for Singapore, right? So firstly, an unprecedented civic space, right? It's not an exaggeration at all to say that some of the largest youth active citizenry movements today across Singapore from climate change to sexual justice to general political interests right can trace their roots in one way or another to Yale and US right in the last four or five years I I've seen and been a part of this massive unprecedented growth of youth active citizenry youth active citizenry it's a mouthful, uh, which have been incubated here that we've not seen in years, right? More so than any other university space, right? Which is not to say that there are no other spaces. It's just that Yale and US had become a particularly important and galvanizing note for building active citizenry, especially among young Singaporeans, right? There, are, there was such limited spaces previously, right, for students and young Singaporeans like me. And I think the question now is what exactly made it so special and powerful, right? And, and Prof. Robin has already talked quite extensively about it. I mean, there are many important elements like the small collegial community with a demographic of students who want to push boundaries. There are academic ethos, right, rooted in civic engagement where education flows beyond the classrooms and natural students who want to do good things and change the world. Now, these two things alone are not exclusive to Yale and US, right? I have many USP Tembusu friends who are just as inspired, just as ambitious. But what really made it special is the third thing, right? And that is of empowerment, right? Unlike the rest of NUS, Yale and US benefited from a significant degree of institutional latitude. There was no student activities office that was policing or censoring what students can do. Instead, you had a very supportive and trusting administration, right, who, who wants students to explore boundaries within reason, right? And within this latitude, I mean, without this latitude, right, and I say this as a member of the founding team of CAPE and having been in many different university spaces, without this latitude, that there would not have been a CAPE. There would not have been so much of what you see today. It's this collective effervescence that's come today. Right. And all these elements come together and it really has created a very unparalleled space, a very dynamic body of young, active citizen Singaporeans. Right? Who, who, and this is not normally something that people until Yale and US were, were before then they were very afraid of engaging and had no means to do so. Right. And it's also, I think, important to note that this was not a closed off ivory tower space, as you say. Right. And it, it, was, it was, in fact, a very open and energizing space 
we were building connections across young Singaporeans, uh, USP, Jambusu, NTU, even JC students were part of the vibrant movements that were growing and building out of this deal in your space. I think now the natural reaction, once you hear what I'm saying, is that of course the state is going to crack down, right? They're not going to allow another uh, Nanyang generation of Tanwa Piaos to, to pop up, right? But also, I'm uh, sorry. Um, yeah. uh, although I think everyone on the panel is familiar with uh, the work CAPE has done, uh, for those mm -hmm. who are hearing about CAPE for the first time, could you uh, just clarify what are some of the causes or issues that uh, uh, the you and your uh, classmates were engaged with? Right. I'm afraid that there might be some misperceptions about, uh, uh, especially when you compare yourselves to uh, Tan Wa Piao. Oh, no, no, no. uh, yeah, uh, yeah, were yeah. the things that you yeah. guys are doing ISAable? To put it down. Yeah. Right. yeah. So, so, no, no, I mean, obviously not, right? I mean, I was going to end a sentence by saying, I mean, I'm sorry to disappoint, but we are not a political threat. We are not Tanwa Piao, right? And I think just to answer your question on CAPE, I mean, CAPE uh, stands for Community for Activism, for, for Advocacy and Political Education. Uh, it was founded in 2017 by Yale and US students and USP students, right? So, it's a, it's a buff that's, that's shared right now. It's, it's coming back to this buff again. Uh, and I think CAPE was really responding to, I think, a lack of spaces for young Singaporeans to engage uh, in, with society, with civic issues. And I think it was really geared towards political literacy. Uh, CAPE did a lot of infographics, uh, did a lot of forums, trying to encourage discussions on policy, uh, civic issues. Uh, we, worked, we worked whenever the new parliamentary bills, we comment on it, we try to uh, increase understanding of it as well. Uh, we, we worked very closely with all of ministries, uh, MPs even. Uh, we worked, for example, on a second reading of the fake news bill, the, the protections against online falsehoods, uh, bills of mark, right? Yeah, so I think that's that's a little bit of background on CAPE. I think CAPE was one of the many uh, groups that used to exist, in, I mean, existed and continued to do so in Yale and US and USP uh, that are pushing the boundary, pushing, you know, the, the space and, and, and trying to, to explore uh, and trying to grow this this active citizenry ethos among our younger Singaporeans. Including on issues that, um, that I think um, older Singaporeans actually welcome the energy of the young, which would include things like climate change. Uh, absolutely, absolutely, and, uh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So I mentioned earlier, I mean, the, the huge outgrowth in, in national climate movements, right, would have been a lot slower, right, we're not, without the governizing power of, of the Yale and US space, right, not students themselves, but the space itself, right. Uh, yeah, so I think going back to the point that, I mean, having heard this, people are just going to be like, of course, the seat is going to crack down, right? And but I'm going to say that we are a pale shadow of the student activists of the 50s to 70s, right? The times are different. The ways in which my generation relates to politics and the state is vastly different, right? And I think this brings me to the second point I want to bring about, about how this is really a more for Singapore as well. All right. Uh, there was an interesting forum on Sunday uh, with Prof Zani, Tong Chai, Chani, right, 4C forum, where they discussed the idea of counter spaces, right? So their thesis was that counter spaces like Yale and US get shut down eventually because independent spaces of critical inquiry and active citizenry contest against tightly controlled authoritarianism, right? This is illuminating. It's a, it's a fair analysis, but I also want to push back against what seems to be a very simple zero-sum dynamic of authoritarian control vis-a-vis -vis student contestation, right? Yes, Singapore has been described as authoritarian, but it's also very robust and, and adaptive, right, in terms of its model of governance. And this is also a model that's facing an increasingly democratic local environment, right? This is the 21st century. And I think this is really where Yale and US comes in, right? It's not simply uh, a, a zero-sum confrontational counter space, right? It's, it's a, it's a co-creative space as well, right? And in Parliament on Monday, you're going to hear accusations of foreign interference, etc., etc. That is just not true, right? In, in, in my time there, the active citizenry of Yale and US, as I mentioned earlier, was deeply grounded in reality, deeply embedded in the wider Singaporean ecosystem. We had close engagements with ministers, MPs, government agencies. There are so many open and friendly relationships that, that really help to channel towards a healthy synthesis of democratic tensions in our society, right? And, and I think especially for the ruling party facing the 21st century, this, this is a wonderful, stable pathway of communication, of, of creative destruction, of, and if you're cynical, even of co-optation and control, right? This could have been a, a very healthy and vibrant environment for how experiment, right? For, for how our, our country could move forward as a maturing democratic society. 
And I think this is probably the thinking that they had a decade ago when the idea of Yale and U.S. began, right? This is a more liberal pre-2011 time of Singapore's governance. Thaman was education minister, right? This is a time when they want to experiment. They saw the value in this experiment. And I think the biggest irony today is that the insecurity and paranoia that fundamentally underlies this shutdown is unfortunately a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? It, it ironically shuts down a solution to these insecurities. It ironically sends a message to many young Singaporeans today, some even younger than myself, right? That no matter how strategic or cooperative young Singaporeans are and trying to engage with the state, they eventually get shut down. And, and it's ironic, right? Because it, it also erodes trust and good faith. It ironically enrages and pushes this new generation of young Singaporeans towards more contentious forms of adversarial politics, which is not what we want, which is not something that Yelena's technically stood for, right? And this is a self-fulfilling prophecy, and it's a big irony of what's happened today, right? And I'm sad over this shutdown, not just on a personal level that, you know, I'm an alumni, my partner and I will not be able to send our kids to the school, but also that Singapore has really lost this powerful experiment that could have meant a lot more for politics, for our democracy, and for the ruling party itself, right? This is the more that you're asking, right? This is the more that Yearling has provided. And now we are turning our back on it. Thanks very much, uh, Howie. Um... I think it's a good time to turn to the uh, our guest, who's a political scientist, uh, uh, Meredith. You know, one of our audience members uh, asked very simply, uh, "What is liberal?" Right? Uh, other questions uh, submitted by the audience point uh, to this uh, tension, which I think Auli has eloquently talked about as well, uh, between the uh, the you know the intellectual freedom that is essential to liberalism on the one hand, and on the other hand, the authoritarianism of uh, Singapore and the wider region. Uh, you know, you've done lots of research on uh, these larger issues of, uh, of movements, contestation and space uh, uh, in, uh, in Southeast Asia and the rest of Asia. Uh, so to what extent do you think the goal of a liberal arts education is compatible with uh, illiberal political systems? Um, and where might we see the contradictions, if any, manifest? Okay. Well, thanks. And it's it's uh, great to be part of the panel. So I'll talk about liberal arts education and what it is and what it entails, and then the norms surrounding higher education and students, including student activism. And some of this will conveniently really abstract and extend from what Robin said and what Hallie just said. So first, um, and, and I'll just start by saying that actually, there's no inherent contradiction between a liberal education or the active citizenry that that's supposed to cultivate with any specific type of regime. And in fact, liberal education is at the root of Singapore's initial forays into tertiary education in so many ways. So I'll just start with that caveat to say that this is not something inherently un-Singaporean, even if this specific institutional model has changed. But so first, what is liberal or liberal arts education? And here I'll, I'll quote Martha Nussbaum, who's a um, professor of law at the University of Chicago. She says that liberal education, and I quote, places the accent on the creation of a critical public culture through an emphasis on analytical thinking, argumentation, and active participation in debate, such that it helps young people learn to speak in their own voices and to respect the voices of others, and to see themselves as not simply citizens of some local region or group, but also and above all as citizens of the world. So they're thus able to appreciate and understand others' perspectives and needs. And I think it's pretty clear how the sort of model that Robin and Helen described could, could cultivate that. So we see liberal education coming through structural features like small class sizes, Socratic seminar style discussions, opportunities for undergraduate research and exploration, extracurricular life, opportunities for engaged or experiential learning beyond pre-professional internships. So all of those help to support this liberal ideological premise or objective, but you can also have, for instance, small seminars without that ideological basis, or you can find other ways to cultivate that same sort of intellectually curious and intellectually empowered approach. So structure isn't everything, but a liberal arts education and the initial framing for and objectives for university education as being really for active citizenry, that was a goal rather than an externality of higher education in Singapore when it was established. So that liberal premise has helped carve out for students and academic staff, especially through the 40s and 50s and 60s and early 70s, a special state space and status even in Singapore and more generally globally. 
So students and academic staff enjoy that because th there's a term of marginal elites, which describes them. So it's groups like students or, or academic staff, the military, the clergy. There's a degree of spatial, being spatially cloistered, that living on campus, being in that community, being able to be bounded being privileged by dint of future, in this case, social role. So it's that, that's also really important. So it's assumed correct and appropriate in this model that students explore ideas, they may read books that are banned for the general public and so forth. But there's a real tension between having that freedom to develop and practice engagement and leadership on campus as a student versus in public as a citizen, at least while one is still a student. So I'll come back to that, but that's really where the heart of the tension emerges. So what's eroded that special status, that shifting the on-campus to the out in public is not, I should specify, it's not just nefarious state action in Singapore or anywhere else. So most importantly, there's been a shift globally toward emphasizing more functional education and applied rather than pure knowledge as tertiary education becomes more common and expected in industrially developed, you know, ambitious societies. So there's more of a focus on human resource development for economic needs rather than developing intellectual or leadership capacity, especially in a post-colonial context. So just sheer numbers, if you have 40% rather than 2% with university degrees, clearly not all will end up as intellectual or socio-political leaders. The internationalization of higher education also complicates that sort of training function, since students may not be local, but they may still feel inspired to engage in the society around them. And that issue is especially germane in Singapore, given rules on foreign engagement. So it's not unusual, for instance, for uh, exchange students or international students at my university or elsewhere in the US to help out with an election campaign, for instance, just for the experience. But that would be more problematic in Singapore. Um, and then there's less support with those turns and with the passage of time generally in society for seeing students as moral authorities via their role as future leaders with responsibility to and a role in society and politics. Some of this is a sort of generic or secular infantilization or, or denigration of the specific social status of students. And so it's not all government action. That said, importantly, Students and campuses globally and historically have enjoyed and can expect a certain latitude protected by robust norms and often concrete laws and intertwined with a presumed responsibility to and for society. It is expected to be a two-way street. So again, that privilege can be confined within the campus gates or can be allowed or encouraged to spill outside. So for instance, Malaysia. Malaysian students had a roadshow for the 1969 elections. It was praised, lauded, celebrated in the media right until the May elections. Um, they had a progressive agenda for political parties and so forth, and they were widely and openly celebrated for social awareness and leadership. But right after May 13th with the UCA and with the immediate shutdown of political activity, they were immediately barred from national politics. And over time, campus and political authorities suppressed even within campus political activities, like having an opposition leader speak on campus. Now that pattern is not unique to Southeast Asia. There were increasing efforts as of the late 60s and 70s in many countries to contain students and their activism physically to the campus. So iconic new gates at Tehran University in 1971 as the Shah did just that. There's been this shift in expectations then for higher education and for the respect for the intendant norms. That's been partly organic. So students' ideas and opinions have garnered less intrinsic respect with the development, for instance, of a professional class of educated politicians. Initially, most post-colonial politicians, for instance, including the average MP in Singapore, they were less well-educated than the average undergrad but also with an ideological turn from a loosely left-wing orientation across universities throughout Southeast Asia and elsewhere by 1950s, 60s, 70s, to a more technocratic developmentalist ethos, especially in Singapore. And the democratization and massification of access to higher ed, which has all sorts of positive benefits, but also does shift the social position. So to be clear though, especially in this in Singapore, what we see is not just a standard story of changes in socioeconomic structures, nor of a hegemonic neoliberalism in Singapore. There is also a history in Singapore of stifling student engagement in the wider society and curbing academic staff autonomy. And that dates back to early times, but with, with um, 
it, it strengthened as of the 1970s. So there were regulations dating back to the earliest years of University of Malaya in Singapore and Kuala Lumpur, prohibiting student societies that were engaged in activities detrimental to the interest of the polity or the public. And there were high profile cases against socialist or left-leaning students. So the university case around the anti-British league in 1951, probably better known Fajar case in 1954. But it's important to realize that colonial authorities at least acknowledged openly in the legal, in the court transcripts, for instance, that they should expect students to be so involved. When you set up universities, that's what you're trying to do is get students to take act, to be active citizens. And so for instance, they dismissed the charges in 1954. The tide turned right after merger. So uh, uh, right after um, merger and then even more after merger. Um, so uh, in 1960s, before there was a suitability certificate that was introduced for matriculation that was to bar undesirable students, especially Chinese educated students. So it's particularly targeted at Nanyang, but it applied to all tertiary education. So with that sort of turn, this idea of that someone who has been politically engaged or leftist as being unsuitable for higher education, students outside political involvement came increasingly to seem beyond the pale. We get to what Halley describes as, oh, we're not Tan Piao yet. And um, I'll touch on him in case people aren't familiar. So in Singaporean terms, you might see this as a shift from civil society activity to only civic society, this sort of state nurturing, productive engagement rather than challenging. So just for those not familiar, very, very briefly in 1974, University of Singapore students uh, mobilized against various issues. So government repression and detention on foreign policy issues, and especially most importantly, on behalf of workers with the Retrenchment Resource Center. So this was on the national and civic stage and it was directed toward the political leadership rather than just as students on campus, so there was that too. So the University of Singapore Student Union encouraged students to quote, go into life and work in factories during the school holidays to learn about workers' plight. Something that we also saw for instance with the Minjung movement in South Korea. That brought pushback. So Tan Ma Piao was quite famously arrested. He ultimately sought asylum in the UK and five Malaysian students were deported for their involvement. Or there is Nantan, Nanyang University, which um, various people have commented on seeing a parallel between Yale and US. So authorities were suspicious since its founding in the 50s of um, left-wing or MCP-linked activities there, and then of its ties with Barisan Socialists, which was challenging the PAP. So there were ISA raids on campus. There were scores of students arrested or expelled in the 60s, especially around the time and involved with Operation Cold Store in February of 63, and around the 19th, September 63 election. So um, 10 out of 46 Barisan candidates were Nanta alumni and around uh, at least 500 students mobilized for the campaign. So there were, I should, should stress, there really were problems of academic standards, facilities, and so forth. Um, and the activism on campus and the repression of it had subsided tremendously well before the 1980 merger with University of Singapore to form NUS, but there is still deep skepticism regarding the reasons for that. Um, and there have been attempts even at the heydays of activism also to reorganize the curriculum and so forth, tied in with Singapore's cultural and language politics. Um, just one other big point to touch on briefly is that there's a history also in Singapore of curbing academic staff. So um, Charian mentioned the recent Academia, Academia SG report about you know, current ways in which um, academic staff feel that they're curbed um, in their actions or teaching. But that that's, has an earlier precedent as well, which is part of why people worry about these things. So PAP Minister To Chin Chai became the vice chancellor in 1968 and was seen widely to disregard norms of autonomy and free speech. Um, so for instance, he started to appoint the deans who previously faculty had elected. So they become accountable to somebody who is a government minister rather than to their peers in the faculty. So again, there is reason for some suspicion if for instance now grant programs seem unconvincingly insulated against political considerations. So to conclude that history and pattern, both of purposeful suppression of activism and university autonomy, alongside very much more organic, naturally occurring, but still concerning reframings of higher education, help to explain why not just the content, but specifically the top-down and sudden manner of this declaration has raised real concerns and hackles. So this has been absent any deference to faculty governance, one of those core academic norms, as a bulwark in defense of university autonomy on the one hand, or to the specific motivations that might have brought students who are seeking a liberal arts education, who knew what that meant, and that approach to choose Yale, um, Yale NUS rather than NUS or other options on the other hand. So there, 
I should just one final note as, as a Yale alum myself, note that there were very real concerns about academic freedom and university autonomy and the likelihood of these when Yale, New, Yale NUS launched. So indeed, part of the justification of Yale NUS at the time was to be a lever to raise the bar for Singapore, at least that was the, the Yale statement. But nothing in this restructuring seems to be driven by those concerns. So yes, those were an issue, but that becomes, and I, I say this mostly to negate it as, as, a, as a reason, that would be a red herring to bring it up as a reason for the current closure. Thanks so much, Meredith. I think uh, uh, my Academia SG colleagues and I were very clear that this should be a session about much more than just uh, Yale and US. It's really a window into um, uh, a much larger trends and concerns. Uh, and, and you've done that beautifully and taken us uh, uh, far deeper than <laughs> we would dared, dared, uh, dared have hoped uh, into Singapore history. So I really appreciate that. Thank you so much. Um, I'd like next to turn to Linda Lim. Uh, I should uh, highlight uh, Linda's uh, bona, bona fides in this. Uh, Linda, like Meredith, is a Yale alumnus uh, who, in addition, taught early in her career at Swarthmore, one of America's top liberal arts colleges. Uh, and in 2004, long before it was a, a glimmer in the education ministry's eye, uh, Linda argued for a liberal arts college to be set up in Singapore. Uh, I don't think that was the only or will be the last occasion when uh, Linda will prove to be years ahead of her time. Uh, and can I start by uh, asking Linda to reflect on the uh, economic logic and uh, financial viability of such institutions? Uh, this is a question that has come up um, already in today's chat and has been surfaced uh, uh, in the debate thus far, that perhaps this is uh, one reason why um, the Yale and US experiment uh, had to end. Uh, would you mind addressing that for us? You're muted, Linda. Start again. Thank yes, you. Yes, okay. So Meredith mentioned that um, globally there has been this move away from liberal education towards vocational education. And just to remind people, I teach in a business school. I do business research. I've sat on the boards of companies, etc. And from a vocational point of view, Actually, liberal arts, uh, liberal education in general, but liberal arts in specifically, is greatly in demand by employers. So even if I look at my students from Swarthmore or my students from uh, uh, Michigan, a lot of them end up in investment banking, management consulting, academia, of course, and public service, because the liberal education is considered a real foundation for all these things. Hey, in investment banking, you need to have critical thinking. You need to pass through all these numbers and you know all, this, uh, all these words to see what's actually there. So I would deny that liberal education uh, has nothing to do with the economy, clearly, as has already been shown by many people, Yale uh, and US graduates are greatly in demand in Singapore, including in our top fin uh, economic sector, financial sector, legal sector, et cetera. So I think it's not different from liberal arts, uh, college education uh, elsewhere. So on the economic side, clearly there's a benefit uh, to Singapore. On the financial side, I think it's also a red herring to say that finances were the reason for the closure of uh, Yale and US. We know that the Yale uh, administrators themselves, like Richard Levin and Pericles Lewis, have denied that finances were a reason. Okay, so, and uh, as Sharon pointed to, in 2004, myself, uh, Pang Eng Fong and Hong Hai, all of us business professors, uh, Eng Fong and Hong Hai actually ended up being the business deans of NTU and SMU. So we're not at all, you know, these sort of airy fairy types, okay? And we figured then- Like the rest of us. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> we figured then that the standalone prior small liberal arts college was financially sustainable in Singapore. 
And I would say that is still the case. It is financially sustainable based on two things. One, if the government subsidizes the property costs of such an institution the way it does for all other institutions of higher learning, and if the government provides base funding per student like it does for other institutions of higher learning, not treating it differently from any other um, university. Above that, however, since there are higher costs associated with small class sizes, a lot of staff support and so on, those costs can be covered in a number of ways as they are in liberal arts colleges in the US. Hey, America has done this for 150 to 200 years. Liberal arts colleges have shown that they are financially sustainable. Some people think that we are smarter and richer than Americans, so surely we should be able to do something that Americans have been able to do for 200 years. In fact, we should be able to do it in 10 years, okay? Because uh, uh, which, which we'll find out is the case. So how else would you cover the excess costs, okay? Um, one, high tuition. This has already been mentioned, especially high tuition paid by international students, which can then cross subsidize lower tuition for domestic students. This is analogous to what is done in so-called public IVs in the US, like mine, University of Michigan, but also University of California, University of Virginia, University of North Carolina, et cetera, where out-of-state students pay tuition two or three times higher than uh, in-state tuition. So this allows us to have lower tuition for, for in-state students. At the University of Michigan, 47% of our undergraduates are out of state. This is analogous to the Yale and US, 45% being um, international. So high tuition is one way. We also call it the high tuition, high aid model. Secondly, endowment. Yale and US endowment per student um, is the equivalent to that of a whole range of US liberal arts colleges which have been in existence for 150 to 200 years, like Colgate, like Oberlin, like uh, McAllister. And this is amazing. How did Yale and US manage to do that? Well, we can get into that in less than 10 years when it took these other institutions 150 to 200 years to build up generations of grateful, financially successful alumni who could donate to them. The Yale and US alumni are still starter salaries, okay? But clearly over time, we would expect them um, being in finance, investment banking, law, and so on, highly remunerated professions in Singapore to be able to um, uh, donate to the endowment. So endowment was something which could grow. Thirdly, government can subsidize scholarships for needy students. You know, uh, this is something which is actually a, uh, would be a big asset. After all, we do have in Singapore PSC scholarships, which pay for government scholars to go for liberal arts education at Oxbridge and the Ivies, which are a lot more expensive than paying for them to go to Yale uh, and US. So, you know, the Singapore has a tradition of, uh, of uh, funding elite education or education for elites. Um, and I think that that is something that is not different about Yale and US. This is a much smaller coterie of students than over the decades we have sent to Oxbridge uh, and the Ivy. So I'll stop there. Uh, thank you, Linda. Uh, if you'd like to engage more fully with uh, Linda's arguments, I'm happy to let you know that uh, uh, Linda has just written a new article that will be uh, available, will published by this time tomorrow. Uh, it was offered initially to the Straits Times, but was turned down. Uh, the Straits Times loss is our gain at Academia SG. Uh, we're publishing it on our website, uh, which I guess has become a kind of like a homeless shelter for academics whose ideas for one reason or other uh, you know, don't pass muster uh, among <laughs> Singapore's mainstream press. Uh, incidentally, our academic freedom survey was reported quite widely, uh, but also not by any national media. But that's another story. Uh, the, uh, Linda, you mentioned um, the, uh, the 
the idea of elite education, which of course uh, slips into the idea of uh, uh, nothing, something not so positive as elitism. This is a, a global issue that goes beyond liberal arts uh, colleges, the, the criticism that elite institutions in general reproduce elitism, a kind of uh, meritocracy that reinforces class privilege. Um, and it's not only about cost, which I guess could be addressed through uh, generous scholarships and so on, but also because um, it's uh, uh, it could be that more privileged families are the ones who are more comfortable with university programs that don't have a very obvious major and not a very direct link to career uh, uh, paths that are very clear. Um, and I think we have to remember the wider context. The world is uh, seeing a wave of anti-establishment sentiment, some of it justified, some of it whipped up by populist uh, political actors. And Singapore does need to get this right. Um, a question from the uh, Straits Times correspondent um, that was uh, sent earlier uh, touched on this issue as well. You know, how do we address, uh, how can Yale and US um, uh, address this issue of possibly potentially becoming um, an institution that just reproduces elitism. Uh, we're, we're very fortunate uh, to have, um, as one of the Academic SG team, uh, Tio Yu Yen, who is, uh, of course, the, the, the author of the extremely influential best-selling book, This is What uh, Inequality Looks Like. And I, I want to start with you, Yu Yen. How, how um, can institutions uh, like Yale and US, but in fact, all elite universities, uh, not be elitist? Yeah, thanks, Sharian. Can you hear me OK? Yeah. Um, first, I think we should recognize that the problem of inequality in access to educational opportunities and the impact of money and other forms of capital on educational outcomes are embedded much earlier on in children's educational journeys. So that by the time young people are of university age, it is somewhat late to seriously resolve the problem. Um, another way of saying that is that the students who are not in tracks that move toward university are already out of the game entirely, and that these are disproportionately kids from lower income households. Um, I think certainly a lot more can and should be done to ensure that universities are spaces where everyone can thrive and where a diverse student body with diversity, including class diversity, can learn from one another. And Robin spoke earlier about the possibilities of this uh, when she talked about the committee that she's on and the ways in which uh, small and specifically set up learning spaces can be very conducive to that. Um, but I think to pin class inequality or elitism as being caused by certain types of programs or institutions at this point of the education journey is to, to misinterpret, I think, the source of the problem. By the time of university, it, it, it is somewhat too late to properly address it and to correct for those problems of inequality and elitism. Now, given this context, I think the larger point you raise about political polarization and the elitism of university spaces, I think we should try to address by challenging universities to go beyond being gatekeepers of status, to go beyond being credentialing machines, to go beyond institutions that naturalize and legitimize inequality. So we need to ask, what are universities' public roles and responsibilities? How can universities engage with the larger society in sustained ways, everyday ways, and through multiple avenues? And this can be done, I think, through research that engages with questions that matter for the well-being of society. It can be done through creating spaces of learning and engagement that are open to people beyond people who are working or who are studying in a university. And uh, through concerted efforts at educating and nurturing students, not just to be good workers, trying to maximize their own career paths, but also to be participants and, and contributors to society. And here, I think you can see, you know, this links back a lot to what the speakers have already said about the, the role of liberal arts education and the ways in which liberal arts education offers a lot of potential for precisely that. Um, and I think students are such a special category of persons, you know, they, 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 I often tell my students, you know, when you're a student and you're out in the world, actually, people are very 
they're, they're very happy to engage with you and they, they really like talking to students and people are especially generous towards students. And so students can play a really, really important bridging role, I think, between the university and the larger public through their participation in civil society, through their activities that uh, that matter on issues that matter to, to other parts of uh, the social body, they, they, they can be really valuable uh, bridges of, of the gaps that, that exist between university and society. So I think student activism, student activity in, in the public space has, has really um, important part to play in, in kind of stemming this tide of of political polarization and populism and, and, and the view of the university as a space that is you know, somehow detached from and, and above society. I'll stop there. Thanks, so just picking up on that, I just wanna share your, um, uh, your optimism um, about you know, the, 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 the special quality among youth. And I think it's, it's, it's uh, to me, it's actually more now, it happens more now than before, in the sense that there's, there seems to be a stronger concern about uh, fairness and justice uh, than there was in uh, earlier generations. Um, so the, the kind of bridge building that is possible uh, and uh, not just possible that the young are prepared to do uh, is something that surely society should take advantage of. Um, I, I want to uh, talk more about the politics of this uh, of all this and, and turn to Ian, um, our resident political scientist, as well as back to uh, to, to Meredith. Uh, we we get conflicting signals from certain quarters about the kind of um, uh, student as well as intellectual uh, as well as citizen that uh, Singapore needs, right? Uh, on the one hand, you have um, critics mocking what they regard as armchair critics or champagne liberals. Uh, on the other hand, when academics and students get off their armchairs uh, and put down the champagne, not that anyone has offered me any, uh, and engage with uh, the pressing issues of the day alongside civil society, they are then accused of playing an illegitimate activist role. Um, and I think our, our survey results also showed quite clearly, you know, the, the fact that uh, uh, academics do see this as um, a serious barrier. Uh, they're getting signals from their employers as well as the wider political climate that engagement with civil society or even speaking with the press, for example, uh, is something to be shunned. Uh, so how does one actually balance these uh, conflicting uh, demands so that you shouldn't be in, the arm, your, in your armchairs, but neither should you be out there? Uh, has anyone found the sweet spot, uh, Ian? How do you reconcile this, uh, these mixed signals? If anyone has found the sweet spot, it wouldn't be me. Um, <laughs> so I, I guess um, where I would start is to uh, locate this in the Singapore context a little bit, because I think uh, Meredith has done such a great job, uh, much better than, than I can ever do about you know, the, the, the broader um, regional context, um, is that I think in Singapore, politics is a bit of a bad word. Um, it is seen as somehow dangerous and participation, um, unless it's done through the ruling people's action party is somehow less acceptable. Um, I suppose um, what people are thinking about uh, in, in those terms are the sort of high politics, right? The, the partisan politics that go on about who is in power, who is not. But um, as a political scientist, I think uh, what I'm also interested in is the everyday kind of politics um, in the sense that no one can escape uh, politics. If we have to live in some sort of community, we have to figure out who does what, who bears more of the burden, less of the risk, uh, gets more of the benefits, etc. So politics, um, that sort of effort to engage in the community, um, that's politics too. It can happen at a very high level, um, right, with the partisan stuff. It can happen in a very localized level when we think about how we um, organize our neighborhood um, or our working spaces. Uh, so in that sense, uh, when we shift our attention to um, thinking about uh, the sorts of uh, activities that uh, students do, uh, sure, I mean, there's a lot of this um, 
I think maybe 90, 95% of the sort of work that they do, you know, is advocating for the very er everyday kinds of things, right? Even when we think about um, the uh, students' union at, at uh, NUS, you know, a lot of time uh, they, uh, they spend, a lot of the time they spend is on, well, trying to get spaces, uh, trying to um, get funding, uh, trying to sometimes uh, uh, weigh in on certain cur uh, curricular measures. I mean, that's all sort of very low level politics. And I would, be very wary about trying to play down uh, those kinds of everyday activities because they are what allow us to sort of get by and self-organize. Uh, and in a world uh, like we're facing now that's rapidly changing, that um, you know, we're being buffeted by all kinds of forces, both uh, external and domestic, um, COVID, um, inequality as you, you and us talked about, you know, in ways that we've not really faced before. Not like a, that at all. Actually, I spent my, I spent even thirteen years of my life with my grandparents. Whether, so uh, whether uh, this is um, um. Uh, so, so, sorry, so whether this has to do with uh, inequality, uh, as you has talked about, also other, other kinds of issues, right? No one really has the answer. Um, and the way that we get around to finding better ways forward, right? There's no formula that will drop from the sky. It comes from experimentation. It comes from trying things out. It comes from talking to people, getting into debates. And that's sometimes uh, what we tend to forget in Singapore. We have this very, um, it's not even technocratic, it's very mechanistic view of how things are supposed to work. Um, and I think uh, what Yale and US and uh, people like CAPE have done and hopefully, um, uh, and also actually a lot of uh, students from um, uh, USP, uh, from uh, the other colleges, and I hope this is something that will carry on into the, the new college uh, that is created, is for students to sort of feel around, to get to know the world around, to experiment a bit and to sort of talk to people and, and move things um, ahead. Uh, because I think uh, where we are at a juncture where that experimentation, that willingness an ability to break old molds, uh, to think boldly, uh, something that I think uh, increasingly, uh, you know, as we get older, uh, we're tied to established ways of doing things. We may be less willing to try. Uh, students uh, have less of that baggage, right? And, th and they are more able to, to do some of this. I know uh, some of the talk um, that has associated with both Yale and US and other student activism in Singapore is that, well, we're looking at the 50s and we're looking at the sort of um, uh, mass unrest. Uh, people look at Hong Kong to a lesser degree, Taiwan, and they get very nervous. But I think um, there, there are two issues that are going on there that probably need to be thought about more carefully. One is, I think, um, the view that students here will just mimic without thinking uh, is a bit insulting to, to our students in Singapore. They are well aware of their environment. They are well aware of what they can do, um, what they should be doing. Um, and secondly, um, when you think about protests, uh, you know, the sort of mass protests that people associate most recently with Hong Kong, those are costly activities for individuals to undertake. So you have to ask yourself, why are people willing to take that cost? Why are people willing to undertake that sort of risk, right? Um, in Hong Kong, uh, as you well know, Chair Ren has, uh, has sort of uh, everyday sort of livelihood concerns, but also issues of, of political space and, and things like that, and, and uh, sort of sense that people's um, identities are being washed away. Now, that's context specific. I don't see Singapore having facing that same sort of pressure, right? So absent that sort of stimulus, I'm unsure as to where this trepidation comes from. Uh, it could be sort of a knee-jerk reaction that we tend to have in Singapore, but um, as someone who likes to pretend at least that I'm evidence-based, uh, I look, I try to look at the evidence. And I don't think that we have that sort of uh, background uh, to, to worry about in Singapore unless things change very drastically. That with the, whatever activism comes out is a symptom, right? Not a cause. I'll stop there, thanks. Well, I'd have to agree with Ian on Hong Kong. It actually always amazes me how uh, this slippery slope argument is made in Singapore. You know, if you allow howlies of the world to get away with, you know, uh, the, the little things that they're doing, they're going to have riots on the streets, you know, next weekend. And it's always struck me that although these uh, uh, slippery slope claims tend to come from individuals who are extremely conservative and pro-government, 
uh, to me, they, they seem to have an extremely low impression of the Singapore government. Uh, they, they seem to think that the Singapore government is as incompetent as the Hong Kong government, which I can tell you it is not. Uh, it's, they seem to think that the Singapore government is unresponsive and unaccountable as the Hong Kong government, which it absolutely isn't. Uh, so I'm, I'm like Ian, I'm mystified as to why they think uh, Singaporeans will behave like Hong Kongers when the context is so different. I have a lot more faith in the, the PAP government than many of these conservatives who talk about these slippery slopes. Uh, Meredith, do you want to chip in there on the politics of uh, all this? Yeah, sure. So I'm just to give a slightly broader framing in terms of institutions and political culture. So we can think of what you and Ian are describing in, in a key way, which is that the effort in Singapore has been a very conscious one. And it's not just Singapore, but it, it's very well done there of reframing politics. So we can think of politics in terms of, of authoritative, authoritative power too. So you're able to come to you know, compel someone to do something. That's the, the politics of electoral politics, of getting into office. Or we can think of it in a feminist sense as empowerment, as being able to affect changes. And so the latter is actually, there is space for that in Singapore, but it's through specific channels. And that's why a group like Halley's can, can weigh in on policies, for instance. The PAP is very open to that sort of, of uh, weighing in. And yet to see these as, as on the one hand, one is allowed and one is prescribed. But on the other hand, all become framed in the same way as dangerous because of an assumed slippage. It's a it's playing both sides in a very strategic way. Um, so we can think of this in terms of what Gary Roden terms um, administrative incorporation, that participation in the policy process that's done through what others in Singapore have called a softly, softly approach of influencing policies, but letting the PAP take credit, that's allowed. But anything that might seem to be challenging the structures or the leadership which it's hard to influence policies to suggest something other than minor tweaking without verging on what might seem to be this other type of politics as opposed to policy that becomes problematic. Um, the other, the last thing I'll suggest is, um, so this, this question of, yes, students can likely engage in the same sorts of activities in another institution in Singapore, for instance, but we're deluding ourselves if we think that self-censorship that affects everyone else in, in Singapore doesn't also affect students. So in as much as students are aware of their assumptions of what's appropriate for students or what's appropriate to NUS or what's, what they think is allowed at NUS, even if there are some who push the envelope, they will be seen as pushing the envelope. So this is something that I've written about as a term intellectual containment. It's this idea of delegitimizing intellectualism or political activism. And I write more about Malaysia, but it's to make it seem inappropriate and un-Malaysian. This idea that what used to be celebrated, students are supposed to be actively engaged as students in their society, as training for future leadership, are supposed to be campaigning for candidates. Lee Kuan Yew campaigned for candidates for the Progressive Party, you know, are supposed to be doing that sort of thing and really trying to make their mark even as students, that that becomes delegitimized. And so it's not a question then of active coercive pressure. It's carefully calibrated, as Terry might say, um, but rather it's it becomes internalized and contained in the sense that you don't need that constant pressure. It, it's something that, that how they can say, look, we're not, we're not engaging in that sort of politics. That would be pushing the envelope. Mm. And I think part of this, um, this work is done by, uh, through language, right? Never being really specific uh, about what exactly the threat is. Uh, so instead it's veiled in these very broad, uh, cloudy terms like, oh, this is controversial. This is sensitive, right? But if you actually probe what exactly is being done, it's in fact extremely innocent. But you know, by by using such terms like controversial and sensitive, it makes it seem as if uh, you are touching on those uh, third rail issues like race and religion and so on. When most of this work actually isn't. Yeah. Uh, let, let me. Um, uh, this is a question for anyone to answer. Oh wait, I, I think Linda is waving a hand. Please go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'd like to make a comment about uh, the usefulness of student activism and engagement um, as a practice for leadership, as Meredith just suggested. You know, um, at least in the business school world, uh, we look at those things, like if you're a leader of some kind of, you know, student movement or whatever, we look at those as what we call resume value. 
Okay. So I mean, I've had experience, I'm sure Marilyn has had too, where we have student activists who deliberately go into certain activities because they want to get into law school or they want to get into business school. It's actually a plus on your resume to say that you have done something critical, actually, because the last thing we want is people who are status quo people. Right? I mean, that you get rejected from the MBA. We are always looking for the leaders. And how do you identify a leader? Somebody who's, or could be just a startup entrepreneur, somebody who's willing to take risk. Okay? So I have had um, at least one big multinational, uh, uh, actually Pfizer, <laughs> uh, where they said that if they get a resume from somebody who says that they had 4.0, you know, GPA, uh, they will throw it away. Because in something like drug discovery, uh, as in other things, you need people who are willing to try the untrodden paths, right? You need a couple of things. You need people who are diverse, who think differently, and who are always probing for this. You don't, may not want to have hundred that. Oh, certainly from an instrumental business, even right-wing point of view, you're always looking for those people who are willing to stick their necks out, willing to make a difference, willing to challenge the status quo. So there's a very instrumental value to that kind of uh, behavior. Thanks, Linda. And I, I think, you know, listening to uh, Robin and how they talk about their experiences, you know, it struck me that it is uh, like the, it seems to be exactly what Singaporeans have said they've wanted for decades. I mean, you know, we talk to parents, we talk to employers and so on in Singapore. What are the most common complaints about the education system? Is things like it's too institutionalized, too much rote learning, too much memory work, not training our kids to think critically, think outside of the box and so on. And here you have an experiment that seems to be answering decades worth of criticism, yeah? Um, but uh, of course, you know, uh, the, the question that we're now confronted with uh, and that has been raised by some members of the audience is, uh, is any of uh, these opinions going to make a difference in terms of the, this decision that has been made, right? And I think realistically, of course, none of us expects the decision to be reversed. Uh, it seems like the, um, uh, the best case scenario uh, is that when the merger does happen, there is some kind of what might be called technology transfer or genetic mutation or whatever, and that uh, that uh, Yale NUS or what's left of it changes NUS more than NUS changes Yale NUS, right? Um, uh, does that, uh, uh, how, how do we make sure that happens? Uh, is that something worth shooting for, that uh, Yale and US can in fact be the, um, uh, you know, the, the germ of something bigger, more interesting, that, that, that more can in fact be uh, transmitted, not just to the rest of NUS, but the rest of Singapore? Or do we just end the experiment here and say that, well, we tried uh, and it's no more? What's the way forward? Anyone? Robin. Um, I, I'll, I'll venture a few, I mean, I don't have an, an answer to this, um, but I mean, I think there are some things that can be learned from uh, the Yale and US experiment about these sort of very, very strong guarantees for academic freedom and non-discrimination. These are things that um, it makes a difference. I mean, this is what I wanna say is that it makes a difference to have that be very clearly and explicitly uh, committed to. So that was something that because of these controversies that Meredith mentioned um, on the Yale side about setting up an institution in Singapore, um, to sort of um, combat that, there had to be an equally strong uh, guarantee of that. Um, and I'm not saying that these things don't exist in other institutions um, in Singapore. Um, of course, everyone in Singapore, um, and I think Meredith touched on this as well, whether you're a student or not, whether you're in academia or not, you're always um, assessing risks and figuring out how far to press the envelope. And so, so it's not that this is unique to Yale and US, but what we did have just kind of historically 
in the way that the college was formed was this very explicit um, commitment to it on paper that was sort of reiterated many, many times. And that sort of a thing makes a difference. It's the same reason that um, mission statements and institutional values, these things are all um, resources that different social actors like uh, students, for instance, they can appeal to them. And I've I've seen this happen many times at Yale and US where um, our, own uh, our own policies have been criticized by students as not living up to our our values. And um, so, so that's sort of a, a thing I think for the new college should be carried over these very explicit commitments to these values that need to be upheld because that is going to provide resources for the kind of internal criticism um, that, uh, that, it, that was really vital, I think, to, to Yale and US. Um, and uh, I, I think also um, the, the, another thing that um, can carry over is that uh, there are students who, because of the, the very tight-knit community that um, we talked about, um, have learned how to, um, I think Ian was talking about this, because they've learned how to self-organize themselves and how to make use of um, uh, essentially power in numbers, um, not just numbers, but because, you know, overall, uh, the student body was quite small, but well-organized numbers. Um, they know how to really amplify their voices and make their perspectives heard. And I think you see that um, with the response to the closure of Yale and US. Um, they, they know that they have to work together with uh, a broader coalition of stakeholders that, so, so Yale and US students, insofar as I've been involved with them, have been very, very clear that um, it's, it's not about some sort of exceptionalism. It's not about this elitism. Um, people at Yale and US, uh, like anywhere, we're, we're all stuck in these systems where we perpetuate systems of inequality. And it's just a question of what do you do when you're in this position? How do you make use of your resources to try and improve those processes and overall uh, work towards um, a society where there will be fewer inequalities. I think Yale and US students have really understood that. And so they make use of their special position and the resources that are available to them. They, they use that to work together with others. And so you see that in this petition, which now has, I don't know if it's like 13,000 signatures or, or something. So um, a lot of those lessons I think are things that um, can carry over to the new college in both of these directions. So I think it matters that it comes from the top, the sort of explicit commitments on paper, and also from the bottom up, the kinds of networks of organization um, and uh, collective power that students have learned themselves how to, how to generate. Well, certainly um, will uh, make the case stronger that the, the main stakeholders, the students themselves, believe so much in the system. And I'm sure that is a message that will come through. The, uh, you know, I do want to uh, ask you to clarify what you mean by the guarantees that were provided to Yale and US, because this has been a mystery to, to many of us on the outside. And so, so there have been these vague uh, commitments to academic freedom, uh, which I think are clearest um, and most concrete when we look at the rules governing uh, student activity, right? And, and uh, uh, how these group is, an, is a concrete example of that. What we're less clear about though is, um, uh, well, number one, to what extent the uh, you know, uh, uh, student and faculty activity can be carried out with a certain amount of impunity. And by this, I mean, uh, I'm referring explicitly to, uh, specifically to, uh, the, the known practice of blacklisting students who've got uh, any kind of uh, disapproved student uh, civil society involvement uh, uh, such that they are blocked from public sector jobs. Um, I'm guessing that uh, there is, uh, you know, that, that Yale and US students, even though while on campus you may be free to organize, you're not immune from such blacklisting. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Howdy, but I'll assume that I'm right. There, there is no guarantee that uh, uh, active students on Yale and US would be free of these uh, restraints. The, the other uh, issue, of course, concerns uh, faculty. I mean, the, the, the open secret that we report in our academic freedom um, report and uh, that um, uh, faculty hiring uh, promotion, even employment passes and so on, are subject to this uh, really quite uh, opaque system of political vetting. Uh, and we've seen multiple instances over the years. Um, it's uh, 
I am again assuming that Yale and US was never immune from this either. So, so let's be clear that uh, I think when we talk about you know, the, the, the uh, exception that was given to Yale and US uh, or the freedom that was given to Yale and US is really quite a, a small part of the, 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 the larger academic freedom guarantees that uh, would be uh, uh, available to any faculty or student at Yale University or uh, other top universities around the world. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. No, I, I, I'm, I wouldn't disagree with that. Um, I mean, I would say that, and this is something that we've seen very clearly in my home country of the US, that these academic freedoms are being eroded even elsewhere. Um, and some of the mechanisms that you mentioned, you know, immigration agencies, the security apparatus of the state, those are always kind of arbitrary and unaccountable. So I don't think that there's um, institutionally necessarily uh, that much difference in terms of the mechanisms that are available to the state. But one thing that I do think um, could, or, or, or that I think you do feel um, is different in these places is the, the sort of wider culture. Um, and so that's why when I said that when you have these things that are put on paper and everyone understands that that is the value you're supposed to uphold, um, even though there are these sorts of constraints, um, I think that makes a difference because when people feel that there are these um, gaps and these inconsistencies um, with what you're supposed to uphold and what you see on the ground, that kind of lays the seed for um, the, the sorts of uh, resistance that ultimately, so, so in the US, I think when, when there are challenges to academic freedom, there's a very, very strong resistance to that. And so even though all the same mechanisms are available, um, there's there's less uh, ability to to just put those in place. In Singapore, I think that's different. Um, but that is the sort of thing that, with this kind of uh, community and ethos um, that can grow uh, from the bottom up, that is something that I think could change in the future. And if it became the case that you know the populace decided that you know these sorts of top down decisions that just come down on us and that are you know as we said before just kind of um, eliminating things in, in one fell swoop, um, if it becomes the case that that is viewed as not acceptable and really not uh, living up to the values of uh, the the sort of um, uh, the nation itself, uh, then I think there's room for for change there and for building up that kind of resistance that you would need. Yeah, if I could add on very quickly, I think we were never under any illusion that we had like absolute freedoms. We were like this little U.S. embassy territory in, in Dover Road, right? I mean, we were under no illusion of that. I think there was always this awareness that this was a liminal gray space, right? This was a gray space. This was an experiment. Uh, and I think to segue back to your earlier question, right? I think we just need this assurance is that what made this space such an important and then useful and valuable experiment can continue on. I think my friend Daryl Yang, uh, he published an article recently uh, talking about various things that the, the new college can do, right? Things like having a commitment to academic freedoms, having, uh, he's just, he suggested an ombudsman on, on academic freedoms as well, right? I think it's a kind of normative culture that really breeds uh, this willingness to push boundaries, right? But the things that, these assurances so far are not credible, right? I mean, how credible can these assurances are when you suddenly have a sudden shutdown of this college, right? Uh, we can only hope that, that the state and NUS has enough foresight and bonus to continue this experiment. But I think the most important thing, right, is operationally, how can you grow graft uh, this onto the new college, right? And I think the number one thing in ensuring that this grafting succeeds is transparent consultation, right? And more than just consultation, co-creation, right? It took three years to, to build Yale and, Yale and US's common curriculum, it took three years to build Yale and US's school itself, uh, its, its faculty, its, its whole vision of education. And more than just three years, it took 10 years of building trust, picking minds, collaborative, shared governance and co-creation to really make Yale and US a kind of important uh, and, and successful experiment that it is today. You can't just transplant this wholesale uh, and then within just two months or two weeks uh, come up with a new college out of nowhere. This is just not the way things are done. It's not the way that you can create this kind of experiments. It's not the way that you can actually make a grafting succeed, right? I do gardening on the side. I mean, this is, <laughs> you can't just graft the tree and just pluck it in and just leave it there without rooting hormones and, and whatnot. Thanks so much. I want to actually uh, uh, pose you the last question as well. I mean, as, as I mentioned at the start, um, 
uh, on Monday, Parliament will be sitting, and thanks to questions um, uh, tabled by the Workers' Party, Yale and US will be in the spotlight again. Um, what are the kinds of uh, uh, questions you would like to hear uh, as follow-up questions? You know, what what what's uh, what will be what will you be listening out to with uh, with most eagerness? What do you hope the outcome will be? Howdy. I think I think I'll, I really want to hear guarantees, right? That uh, that as a country and as a government, I mean, the, the government's had this slow slide away from the, the more experimental vision of the pre-2011 days that a uh, guarantee is that we are not walking away from this, right? I mean, yes, we can we can go along the lines that yes, it's a financial sustainability concern, it's an elitism concern, it's a it's an issue of expanding access. It, I mean, if you stick to it, I'm fine with it. But if you're going to attack like the Yale and US experiment and all that, I'll be I'll be quite disappointed, right? I, I think the kind of questions I want is really questions on guarantees, assurances that that they see the value to, uh, that probe as to whether they actually still see value in this experiment. I think that's something that's very important to me as a young Singaporean. It's something that's very important to many of my fellow Yale and US community alumni as well. It's that assurance that we still believe in the same visions of of a Singapore, right, and a Singapore is moving towards a maturing democracy. Yeah, we still believe in building a democratic society. It's literally in our pledge. That is uh, beautifully put, and it saves me the trouble of trying to sound uh, intelligent or gracious or any of those things that hosts are supposed to say. So all I will say is uh, thank you to our guests, uh, Howley, Robin, and Meredith. Uh, thanks to my Academia SG friends and everyone in the audience. Uh, this video will, in case you didn't miss the start, uh, will be up on our website uh, by tomorrow. Uh, look out for Linda's article as well and do subscribe to our uh, mailing list if you haven't already. Uh, thanks so much and good night.